Okay, welcome to Computer Networks, Lecture 15. Homework 7 and 8 are already out, as you know. Um, 8 is due next week, but it really builds on 7. Another thing that I wanted to remind you of is the exam. The schedule has been up for a while, but uh, in case you didn't get a chance to go to the page, exam 2 will be on the 23rd of April. Did, uh, was this a surprise for anyone? No. Okay, that's good. So we're all on the same page. Okay, homework seven. Let's uh, spend a few minutes talking about homework seven. The goal is to build a routing protocol and a forwarding engine or a forwarding system. A router has two components, right? Uh, forwarding and routing, and we're going to do both of them in homework seven and eight. Homework seven mostly concerns with forwarding. And in homework eight, we actually compute the routes. We talked about port assignments uh, last week. If, in case it's not clear, you can go look at the video from not last week, but the last lecture on uh, what ports you're supposed to use. For homework seven, we gave you, you know, some code, not all of it. Um, so the code that we gave you should uh, actually help help make it really easy to, to risk the homework. I heard that it wasn't necessarily less co less work than the previous assignments, but I think this initial code will help you a lot. So let's, um, I'm, I'm going to show you at least some parts of it. The network is working still about how this is going to work. So let's minimize this. Let's minimize this. OK. So I'm in Bayou. <coughs> As we uh, listed the topology on the whiteboard just a few minutes ago, so the first thing that we need to do is have these files that describe that topology. And we said we're going to uh, describe the topology using the files called link file. So link files are going to list uh, what are the links, what are the adjacent neighbors. For example, for node 1, what are the neighbors? 2 and 3. So, um, this is how we specify the neighbors. Let me move this. Can you, can you guys all see this? Barely? <coughs> I don't know how to make the projection brighter. <laughs> the first line says 2 space 20802. The second line says 3 space 20803. Uh, what that uh, means is uh, there are two neighbors of this node, one, node number 1. They are nodes 2 and 3, and they're running on ports 20802, 20803. They're running their routers on those ports. That's what it means. OK. So let's actually go through all the link files. Link 2. So what, what should link 2 say? Say that, right? And 5520805. OK. How about link three? So one two zero eight oh one and four two zero eight oh four. How about uh, four? What should it say? Say so three two zero eight oh three and five two zero eight oh five. Oh, no, this should be five, sorry, yeah. OK, uh, did, did we make any other mistakes? No, not yet, OK. Did you already look at five? No, we haven't, OK. Five should be two, two, zero, eight, oh, two, and four, two, zero, eight, oh, four. OK, good. So we specified all the links. Right, so we captured that topology. We said we're going to use, what, what's the cost that we're going to use in this assignment? Did you guys answer it? We're going to use hop count. One. Yeah, so all the links are going to have a cost of one. So if we need to route a packet from, let's say, one to five, what path should we use? Go to two to, go to, two to five. So in this assignment, we're going to specify these routes manually. <coughs> So if uh, we were to 
encode that. So we're going to say, so the routing table for 1, right? So if the destination is 5, what's the next hop? 2. So this is how we're going to specify the routes. Uh, that is not adequate for the packets to be forwarded, right? We also need to provide the routing table for 2, which is a 5, 5. Any questions? So, so far what we've done is specify the topology and specify the routes. So with this routing table that we just talked about, um, do we know how to route packets from 1 to 4? We don't. We don't know. Right? So if we have more routes, we can just uh, put them in additional lines. Okay. So we've specified the topology, we've specified the routes, now we can run the routers. It uses pthread, right, the sample code that is sent. Who has not done threads programming? Okay. All right. Uh, I ran that again. Yeah. I think I posted a tutorial to threads on the assignment. Uh, of course, uh, you're welcome to use any other sources that you like. I think I understand. I just haven't actually worked with it. Yeah, it's, a, it's pretty simple idea. So it uses threads, so we're going to use. So in my case, the source is called backup node. Let's compile that a bunch of warnings. Um, so I guess in my code, in my case, the executable is called a.out. I could always do dash o node, right? I didn't do that. Uh, by default, the executable is a.out. Now, how am I supposed to execute the program? So now I need to execute one process per node. How many nodes do I have? Five. So I'm going to actually execute node five times. Or in this case, we're just going to do a dot out. Any, any question there? So basically, we're going to have one, pro one process represent one router. OK? So let's run router number one. So what are the arguments? That's it. That's it. That's my router. It's running. So on which port is it listening for packets? 20801. And it thinks, what are the neighbors? Nodes 2 and 3. And if this router wants to send a message to those other routers, it's going to send messages on those ports, 20802 or 20. 803. So let's uh, look at, uh, so this, uh, this code actually allows you to look at the list of interfaces. It makes sense, right? Okay, so that part is not complete here, but you're supposed to complete that part. <coughs> the code um, already goes through the link file and puts in the appropriate data structure. There are some data structures that you're supposed to define, but their skeleton is already there. So here are the interfaces. It makes sense. So let's look at one other router. OK, it's going to be a hard for you to see. But OK, let's uh, execute another one. Oh, it's so hard to see, huh? Okay. All right, so let's uh, launch node number two. Two zero eight oh two. Okay. That makes sense. Right. Let's actually look at what's going on. So this is you know homework uh, actually eight. So they are already exchanging the topology, and eventually routes. Okay. So what is node 1, what does node 1 have on its routing table? So let's actually control C this for a little bit. Or no, we don't need this. It's slow enough. So it says it received a beacon from 2. That makes sense. It's connected to 2. And 2 is the only other router that's up right now. And uh, it says it's in, in its routing table. It's already building this dynamically. 
Uh, entry number one is uh, destination one cost zero. That makes sense itself, right? Uh, destination two cost one. How did it uh, discover this? Two cent. Yeah, two cent uh, beacon, right? Okay. Now let's uh, let's see let's see what happens when we control C. What should happen when when we control C? So we dilute it. How does it uh, know that uh, there is no no two anymore? I guess we're describing assignment eight as well. Oh, no. Yeah. So let's see. Oh, unfortunately, I think I used a. No, I I, I think I did, but I think it's thirty seconds. Okay. So I don't think we're gonna wait that long. So let's uh. Put two. Oh, oh it, it did expire, right? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let's go here. Let's do node five. Uh, how do I launch node five? Five two zero eight zero five. So right now it's only receiving beacons from two, right? Node number one, as you, as you can see, up here. Okay, it's hard to see the pointer. So what will happen uh, when I launch node 5? It has also started receiving beacons from node 5. Does that make sense? OK, let's see. Let's see if that happens. Oh. OK. Right, let's, uh, let's write something here. Uh, we can just say 1, 2. It actually learns the routes dynamically, but it's just expecting that file. So what's going on now? So the routing table on node 1 is, oh, so it, it now has three entries. Do you see that? How about routing entry on node 2? Also has three entries. So let's look at routing entry on node 1, which is this window. It says to get to destination 5, what's the next stop? 2. Cost is 2. Do you see that? All right. If I, I can just type I and list the interfaces. Uh, routing table is not implemented, but it's uh, showing that on the screen. Now, how do I send packets? So let's say I need to send packets from, this is node 5, right, the terminal that I'm on right now over here, send to hello. Oh, do you, do you see the message here? Hello receive. You see that? Now, from here, if I say send for hello, what should happen? Don't know how to forward to four. But if I say send one five, see that? Now let's actually do multi hop. Let's see if it, let's see if this works. So if I say send one, uh, hello again. What should happen? So we should uh, see stuff on uh, this terminal first. It will receive the message, and it will forward that, right? Because if you look at the routing table, to go to 1, we need to, uh, we need to go to 2 if you, if you see the routing table on your right-hand side, top right. OK, let's, let's uh, hit return here. OK, let's uh, control C this. Let's control C this. OK, let's see what happened here. We said send, and it says data sent to 2. Right? And then we have a terminal open on node 2. It actually got data, but it turns out the destination is 1. And it's just forwarding to 1, sending to port 20801. And it actually receives data. And it prints that. How does it know which port to send it to? This node. From the link file. The routing protocol tells the node corresponding to this terminal 
what's the node ID? What's the next half node ID? And then you go to the link table and say, to get to this node, here is the port on which we need to send the message. That, that's how routers work. For example, when you receive a packet, okay, I need to send this packet to uh, this IP address. Right? On which interface would I send that packet if we're talking about wired interfaces? A router will have a large number of uh, interfaces. My laptop, for example, only has uh, one wired interface and one wireless interface. Right? Actually, it does not have wired interface. I forgot. Uh, but you know, most laptops they have you know one wired and one wireless. Every time you need to send a packet to a certain destination, you need to know which interface to use. Right? Similarly, uh, even though we know what the next stop is, we need to know, okay, how, how do we get these packets to actually get to that next stop? And that port number uh, gives us that information. Okay, any, any question about uh, homework seven at least? So this is, you get a rough idea for how you, how you should debug your programs, right? And also a count to infinity, actually, next uh, lecture. Uh, we could do that. Yeah, question. That wasn't a question. Um, in the homework description, it doesn't actually say that you print out the payload anymore? Yeah, you don't need to print out the payload. But it might be nice for you to do something like this for debugging. Yeah, for debugging, yeah. But you're supposed to print uh, messages like this on the log file. And it actually gives you exact format. Right, right. but it just doesn't say to do anything with the string. Uh, on, on, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, don't worry about it. Any, any other question? So in the homework, we didn't say you need to print this or that on the screen. Right? But it's uh, useful. Uh, it's, it's very helpful for debugging. Any questions about what we just did? Might be a good idea to ask question now, then uh, get confused later. Yeah. So the sequence number. Uh huh. Does each node keep its own separate sequence number? Yes. Yeah, so the question was, does each node keep its sequence number? And the answer is yes. Uh, you can start it at zero. That's probably the most convenient thing to do. Why, why do we need sequence numbers? So you know which packet it is. So yeah. You can debug if it's out there. And exactly. Yeah. Uh, you want a sequence number so that uh, uh, you can debug them. Uh, for example, you're, you sent uh, just, uh, let's say, 10 packets to the first 10 different sequence numbers. And once you have the log files, you can search for packets with a given origin and sequence number. And then you can see you know, where, where that packet went. Right? It's origin ID and sequence number that uniquely identifies that packet. So let's say you want to know uh, the path taken by a packet. And you just uh, you know, search through all the log files, instances in which you know, that particular origin ID and that sequence number appears. And if you print that in a consistent way, let's say, for, again, this is for debugging. Let's say you, every time you see a packet, you say, you know, receive or send or whatever the event is, followed by a space, and let's say in parentheses, origin ID, comma, sequence number, right? And if you actually output this to your log files, then you can just grab for that and it will show you everywhere that packet showed up if you print that in a consistent manner. And that's actually very useful when you're debugging a large network. And you have lots of log files with uh, you know, thousands and thousands of lines. Uh, you can just do a simple search. Simple search. Let's say you know, we're, looking for, uh, you know, we're looking to understand what happened uh, uh, with the packet number, let's say, 5 sent by node 1. Then we just search for, in a parenthesis, 5 comma 1. And we'll show all the instances of that packet. Any other question? Because based on this information, uh, I think homework seven should be pretty straightforward. What would you say was the most challenging uh, part again, uh, just so that every, everyone can uh, appreciate what what they might face, what might be challenging? Yeah, I didn't think it was. I think it was just time consuming, not much challenging. Because with the sample code you've got, um, well, I mean, kind of getting used to that because it's a different style from what I'm used to. Yeah. Um, like it didn't compile it every trigger. Oh, I didn't. I don't know if I tried it first. <laughs> it, it does compile. Okay. It does uh, compile. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think uh, now you have a uh, you have more ideas on the 
the most efficient way to debug and visualize what the nodes are doing. Um, based on you know what we just saw, it should further speed up the the development of this code. What was your intuition for how you're going to debug this system? Did you do something like this pretty much yeah, from the? Yeah, different notes here and there, and yeah. basically for debugging now, I've got um, every time I log it, I'm just going into the message. It's going to be logged. Yeah. So exactly. I can see it on the screen that it's happening. Yeah. Exactly. Like, you know, five or six of them in the middle of the window. Yeah. And uh, this type of debugging does not scale to a large network, obviously. For that, you just uh, launch all of the nodes and start <coughs> looking at the log files. And you don't need to be interacting with the terminal of each node. Really, only want to do that on the sending node. That's, that's all, right? But sometimes uh, it's uh, helpful to be able to go to any terminal you want and look at the routes or neighbors or in interfaces. That's the language we're using. OK, any, any other questions? OK, seems like uh, we're all set with uh, homework. All right, let's. Uh, Okay, it works. Now, just to summarize, in homework seven, we focus on forwarding. We don't have to dynamically discover the links or routes. The route file tell you what are the destinations that are reachable and what's the next hop. In homework eight, which we showed uh, just a minute ago, uh, we're going to have these routers send these advertisements and discover the routes. It's pretty simple. You'll, you'll realize that once you start working on it. Only use the ports that you're assigned because it's going to mess up uh, somebody else's debugging. And also it's going to mess up your own debugging, actually, uh, because uh, other students might be sending messages on those ports. All right. So we're going to talk about inter-domain routing today. But before that, Let's just to remind ourselves, because it's been, I think, about a week, or actually more than a week, since we talked about routing protocols. So we talked about two different types of routing protocols, distance vector routing protocols and link state routing protocols. In distance vector routing protocol, each node only gathers information about its neighbors, computes some routes, and then send it, send it to your neighbors again. That's, that's what we do, right? And the information that you're sending to your neighbors is the just, uh, distance to the destinations. Um, for example, a node might say, uh, destination 5 is 10 hops away. Destination uh, 6 is 11 hops away. Right? In link state routing, you propagate enough information so that all the nodes have a complete picture of the entire graph. And graph, in this context, is the nodes and the edges in the network that's available for routing. All right. So those are the two types of routing protocols that we talked about. In the context of distance vector routing protocol, we, we discussed how these protocols might adapt to failures. For example, if the link FG fails, you advertise a cost of infinity that allows you to select a path that's shorter than infinity. Right. Okay. So talk about count to infinity. And you'll get a chance to understand this in even more concrete detail when you do homework eight. Because one of the things that uh, you have to demonstrate is is mechanism that that will help you find routes even though when you have a, even when you have a topology that might cause the protocol to show this problem count to infinity in the next lecture i'll show you what it looks like on those terminals we'll create a very we'll create one of the smallest topologies that will have this problem and then we'll break one of the links and then we'll see how that 
causes kind of the infinity problem. But you don't have to implement this for homework seven. You're just doing forwarding. All right. And we said we actually don't use those protocols in the wider internet. Do you remember that? So we use those protocols usually in a smaller network. For example, if we wanted to do routing within an organization or a small network of, let's say, 10 or 20 or maybe 100, 200 nodes, we use those routing protocols. But in the wider internet, we don't use that routing protocol. And we started talking about why. Right? Uh, why don't we? Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons why we don't use the same protocol in these two types of networks is because they are very different. And in what ways are these networks different? Inter are the networks within an organization, within an autonomous system, and the wider internet. How are they different? Uh, first, uh, it's a question of trust. Uh, there are certain networks uh, that we are hosts or routers that we trust more than others. And why does this matter? Well, if we trust certain nodes or routers, we might be willing to exchange more information or certain kinds of information that we would not share otherwise, right? There might be policy differences that, uh, or there might be policies that determine what kind of routes are desirable in one type of network versus another. <coughs> For example, when we're talking about routes within an organization, um, Usually, we're allowed to use any, any path we want, usually. But in the internet, that might not be the case. Maybe a certain ISP doesn't like you, or they want to charge you more money, etc. So clearly, uh, we, want to have, we want to be able to select paths using slightly different mechanisms. Scale, um, if we have a large number of nodes, the internet scale, uh, we need a routing protocol that scales to that large number. Uh, let's think about link state routing. Do you think that will scale to millions and millions of nodes? Why not? Too much global state. Yeah, basically we're saying each node knows the entire graph, right? And performance. Uh, for example, when you're routing within a small network, maybe what you care about is finding the route that is the most efficient between point A and point B. That's what we care about, right? So let's say I'm here in this building and I need to send some messages to someone working at a different building within University of Houston. It's an engineering building. What I care about is, you know, what is the fastest way to get data from here to there? Uh, do we want that in the internet? Do we want uh, the most efficient routes in the internet? Kind of a strange question, huh? Yes, yes, I do. Yeah, <laughs> maybe you do. <laughs> but maybe the network operators, they don't. Can you think of any reason why they might not? Some bandwidth can be problematic if you don't know the entire network. Yeah, so if you don't know the entire network, it's going to be problematic. But why might the operators sometimes want to use suboptimal routes? Cost. Cost. Does that make sense? So. Because you know, ultimately, it's a business. You need to run it like business. And how to reduce cost and how to maximize profit or revenue so that you can maximize profit. Right? Uh, so what are the costs to an ISP? First of all, there is the capital cost. right? You need to buy equipment. Right. So first of all, you need equipment. And just the cables, that's what you need. Is that enough to be an ISP? Mm, cooperation from people who are in other parts of the internet, I guess. Right, so you need cooperation from other ISPs, other parts of the internet. And how do you get cooperation? So let's say you have a pile of routers and pile of cables in this room. How do you... Pay for their servers to connect up to it. Yeah, so you need to actually pay to connect to certain types of ISPs. So we actually sell connectivity, and that's the reason performance is not the only metric that you're optimizing in the routing. So how do we use distance vector routing protocol to achieve some of these desirable 
uh, properties, it's, it's going to be challenging. It's just not going to work as it is. Right? Okay. So before we uh, start discussing the protocol, let's think about the type of uh, autonomous systems. So there are some stub autonomous systems. So these are organizations or autonomous systems that form the leaves or that are at the edge of the internet or that don't have multiple um, connections to other autonomous systems. So these are usually small ISPs. So small ISPs or small organizations or small autonomous systems, they might just connect to one bigger ISP, for example, and get, get their connectivity that way. Right? And they might just have retail customers. So these are stubs. Some autonomous systems might be multi-homed. Actually, most of them are. Uh, for example, do you think it's a good idea for an organization like University of Houston to be a stub autonomous system? <clears throat> and why is that not a good idea? So do we become a stop? Sorry, yeah. Probably a lot of traffic coming in from outside and looking around your own. Yeah. Can point of connection is a problem. Right. So, but my question is, should we just to have uh, you know one connection going to a larger autonomous system? Yeah, because then they have control. Over you. Yeah. Control First of all, they will have control over us, right? What's the other other reason why <clears throat> they might want to be multi-homed? Single point of failure. Yeah, single point of failure. Right. If you have two different uh, providers, or if you're connected to two different autonomous systems, and let's say link to one of the autonomous system fails, or let's say contract with one of the autonomous system fails, we, we have a backup. Right? So these are called multi-homed autonomous systems. And finally, there are transit autonomous systems. These autonomous systems allow traffic to enter you know, one end of the network and then exit to another end of the network. For example, these might be carriers. Right. Okay. Let's think about uh, some, uh, some of the types of relationships that different autonomous systems might want to have. All right. Let's look at autonomous system X. So let's say that's uh, us, University of Houston. And let's say we have two different ISPs to which we connect. Right. So what are those two ISPs? BNC. BNC right? So let's say we connect to BNC. What uh, B could do is Rather than sending traffic from, let's say, B to C, right? let's say B also has other customers, right? Not just us. Rather than sending, and let's say it has its uh, customer that wants to send a packet to Y, or a bunch of packets to Y. B has two choices. What are those two choices? Or actually, B has many choices. And B could send that traffic B, A, C, Y, right? Could do that send that uh, traffic B, C, Y. And what's the other, other option? B, X, C, Y. So which one we don't want? B, X, C, Y. B, X, C, y. Why, why do we not want that? Because X is whatever relationship. It's like multi-home. It doesn't, doesn't allow transit traffic. Yeah, but uh, let's, uh, let's not, first of all, why does it not want transit traffic? So let's say X is the University of Houston, B and C are our internet service providers. We have some capacity. But how about uh, you know, B just uh, send uh, traffic that we can handle? Let's say we write the contract that way. Is that desirable for us? But we're not in ISP business, right? So we probably don't want to you know, invest in the infrastructure to do this kind of routing. We don't want to be a transit 
Yes. And in the contract, most likely what it says is for the privilege of connecting to X, University of Houston is going to pay this much money every year to X. For the privilege of us being able to connect to C, we're going to pay C this much money. So does it make sense for us to do this transit? Yeah, so let's okay. say... Yeah, B says, okay, I want to send a bunch of packets to Y. How about you know, I send it to X? X sends it to C, to Y. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense, right? We're not getting any money for that. Any question here? So this is the type of policies we want to be able to enforce. Technically, we can have the ability to send packets from B to X to C to Y. Technically, it's possible. Look at the links. Right? You can, you can construct a path. But for the reasons we discussed, we don't want that. So when does it uh, not make sense to allow transit traffic? When you're not getting paid for it? Yeah, exactly. When you're not getting paid for it, then why do the transit? OK, good. Here's another scenario. Let's say you want to disallow CBA transit. All right? So we, we don't want that transit to happen, because uh, there are many ways in which, uh, even in this very simple topology, there are many ways in which uh, you could send packets from one node to another, right? So let's say B says, The route to Z is BAZ. So that's the route of advertisement. Right. Now, should B, so what, what should B advertise to C? That's the question. Because you have the ability to advertise different routes to different neighbors, unlike in distance vector, simplistic distance vector routing that we talked about. Actually, even in distance vector routing, there is, there is one scenario in which we were advertising different table to different neighbors. Can you tell me? But that's actually something very important to keep in mind. When was that? We were advertising different table on different links. No, so let's say we have node A, and I have a number of neighbors, and node A is going to advertise different table, different, uh, different values, different routes to different neighbors. Can you think of that example? We actually did that last time. When you have a problem, what is a, when you have count to infinity, what's one of the ways in which you can uh, try to tame that problem? Advertise back to the person who yeah, exactly. So that's one. Another, something related to that. So it's called poisoning or something? Poison reverse. It's, it's called route poisoning. Yeah. If you, that's a general term. So you basically advertise the cost of infinity. right? So similarly, uh, in BZP, you're allowed to advertise different routes to different neighbors. Why might you want to do that? Prevent people from going yeah. out. Yeah, prevent people from going that way, or allowing some people to go in some uh, special routes, right? You might don't want to do that. So, um, so let's just think of this uh, scenario here. Let's say we don't want the packets to go through CBA. We want to prevent that transit. All right. So, how can we make that happen? So uh, if you think about the packets going from packets that need to go from Y to Z, so those are the two options, right? C, B, A, Z, and C, A, Z. Those are the two options, right? So what should C advertise to prevent that trend? C, A, Z. So C, A, Z. Okay, so a lo lot of the 
So configuring BGP, you know, if you had to configure it, comes down to choices that you make, like the, like the ones that we discussed. You can come up with many other scenarios where, OK, you want uh, to advertise this route to this neighbor, and why is that? Usually it has to do with business relation. OK. Here's an, if you go to that link, you'll see a list of autonomous systems. There are many other lists you can find uh, if you search on Google. But if you go there, you'll see a list of autonomous systems, uh, including the one for University of Houston. There are also you know, one autonomous system. Okay. So how do we design a routing protocol that allows us to route in a network of autonomous systems? So that's, that's what BZP is about. So the idea is called path vector protocol. It's very similar to distance vector routing protocol in the sense that you accumulate the costs as you advertise the routes across the network. That's what we do in distance vector routing protocol, right? So let's say I'm node B. Node A says cost to destination is 5. Then I advertise a cost of 6 to my neighbors. That's, that's how distance vector routing protocol works, right? But the problem that we had there was uh, we had uh, loops. So in path vector routing protocol, in addition to advertising the cost, we also advertise the path for which we're advertising the cost. <coughs> why, is this, why is this an improvement over distance vector routing protocol? First, we can actually look at the list of autonomous systems that would be on that path, not just the cost. Right? And once you have the list of autonomous systems, we can start making policy decisions. <coughs> In distance vector routing protocol, all a node receives is to destination x, the cost is 10. That's it. We have no idea what autonomous systems that path goes through. Right? But if we have a list of nodes that constitute that path, we can start making some policy decisions. And we can also avoid the loops. How is that? How can you avoid the loops? If you have a list of all the nodes? Yeah, so we can just look at the list of nodes and see if they repeat. And the moment it's about to repeat, you know, okay, there, there is a loop. Right, okay. So this is what it would look like. Let's say two nodes a path to one. It's going to say, okay, destination one, and the path is going to be two, one. As opposed to distance vector routing protocol, we would just say destination one, cost one. That's what we did, right? But here we're going to actually say this is the path. Now, three is going to say to four, three is going to advertise, okay. I know a path to one. And the path is three to one. So that's the idea behind path vector protocol. Any question? So the protocol that um, is used for interdomain routing is BZP. That's the most uh, common protocol. So the idea is you abstract an autonomous system as a single node. For example, you'd abstract University of Houston as a single node. And why is that uh, a reasonable thing to do? Why is that a reasonable thing to do? Earlier, we were talking about uh, one host as a node in the graph, but now we're saying entire autonomous system is a single node. Why is that a reasonable thing to do? Say it again. It's a high-level protocol, but uh, if you also think about uh, the physical topology that determines how different autonomous systems are connected, this seems like a natural representation. Can you tell me how different autonomous systems are connected? Physically. Are they connected uh, with lots of links between them, or a small number of links between them? Or Let's think of your homes. Right? You might have uh, five to 100 devices at home. They're all connected to the internet. And if you think of that as an autonomous system, <coughs> can you describe to me how the physical connection looks between your home and your ISP? One link from your home out to whatever network they have. Right. 
Right, so there is just one link between your home and the ISP. So if you wanted to come up with a packet forwarding policies, it's reasonable to abstract all the devices that you have at home as a single node. If we just wanted to answer the question, okay, I need to send a packet to your laptop. To which node should I send this packet? It's probably the router at your home. Does that make sense? So it's actually pretty natural that we might do this. It's not just because it's high-level protocol. It also seems like it's a pretty good representation for the type of questions we want to answer when we uh, study interdomain routing. The destinations are IP address prefixes. And the nodes exchange prefix reachability. Basically, nodes say, I can reach this prefix over this path. Here's an example. I can reach this prefix on this path. So that's the path. List of autonomous systems. That's the path, just like what I showed earlier. And if you're curious what these numbers are, you can go to that list and find the names of these autonomous systems. You should have the name of the organization if you go on that list. And a router is going to receive a series of advertisements like that from all the neighbors. <coughs> and the job of the router is to pick the path that makes sense from the policies that are in place in the organization, business contract between the ISPs. It's a very widely used protocol, BGP. And there's a lot of ongoing work and understanding BGP and using BGP to do new things. And um, also it helps you explain why certain types of outages happen uh, with the hope that uh, maybe we can build an internet that's more robust. All right, so let's uh, look at an example. Let's say we have a network that looks like this. So now we're comfortable with the idea that we're going to uh, represent an entire autonomous system uh, as a node. Right? Okay. So we have autonomous system one. Let's say this is an ISP. It has a lot of um, customers. They have their own IP addresses. But they're all assigned IP addresses in that range, specified by that prefix. All right. We want anyone in the internet to be able to send packets to these nodes, right? Otherwise, uh, we don't call that internet connection. That would be a walled garden. So how is it that the entire internet learns about the paths the packets should take to get to these IP addresses that are customers of AS1? Well, AS1 first advertises. Saying, okay, I am AS1, and here are the IP addresses that I know how to deliver packets to. Because AS1 knows how to deliver packets to its customers, because it knows where they are, on which link they are. So for example, when you dial into your ISP, your ISP knows your IP address, and your ISP knows that if there is an IP, or if there is a packet that comes in to you, uh, to which modem? if you're using a modem or a router, it should transmit that packet. Just like when we were talking about the router example in our homework, right? So let's say one receives a packet with the destination two, one knows on which port it should forward that packet on the topology that we talked about earlier. So AS1 says, here are all the IP addresses to which I know how to send packets. All right? And what does AS2 and ES5, what, what do they do? They actually advertise that fact to their peer autonomous systems. And when they advertise these paths, they actually put their ID in the path. Right? So the path is you know, 2 1 now if you're looking at the advertisements coming out of no, or autonomous system 2. And the path is 5 1 looking at the advertisement from the router for autonomous system 5. And they advertise that again. 
Now, autonomous systems five or two, three, four, and five. Now they need to make a decision. They've, they've heard all the advertisements. Okay, so now they need to, so each autonomous system now knows of how many potential paths. Autonomous system two, how many potential paths does it know? That's not true. It knows about two different paths now. It also heard an advertisement from autonomous system three, probably. But clearly that's a, that's a worse path, right? Just to make it simpler even, okay. How about autonomous system four? Even if you just look at the arrows there, you know, it clearly has heard of two different paths. That's actually true for all the nodes there. But let's just focus on autonomous system four. It heard of one path from which node? There are two, two paths it heard of. From five and from three. So it needs to now decide which path to take. So which path should it take? Yeah, if, if we're using the shortest path, then we select that path. But clearly, that's not the only way to select the paths. So this is where the policy comes in. So you have a list of paths that, that are available to you, then you need to consult uh, your policies. So let's um, just uh, you know, skip the details and let's just say that BZP routers, they also are just like processes that we talk about in homework. They exchange messages on certain ports using certain protocols. We're using UDP, BZP uses TCP, and uh, they're just exchanging this reachability information. Once you exchange reachability information, you have a list of routes, and then your task is to decide which one to use. Is BGP loop free? The answer is right there. You know the entire path, right? You're advertising the entire path. Do all the autonomous systems know all the paths? Yes or no? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> you, can, you can choose to not advertise certain paths. Right? For example, our service provider can say that okay, I can't reach this particular set of IP addresses. And let's say that's, that's our only upstream ISP, then we wouldn't know how to send packets there. Right? As an example. Do we lose efficiency by abstracting the entire autonomous system as a node? We do. Can you tell me? Tell me how. How do we lose efficiency? There's an additional step. Yeah, there is an additional step in determining how to forward packets once the packet reaches that autonomous system. Anything else? And why we might lose efficiency? If you want the most efficient routing possible in the internet, what's the best way to do that? You want to know the entire graph, right? You want to know the entire graph. The moment you are hiding some information, uh, you might lose efficiency. So how large are these tables? Pretty large, it turns out. This is looking at the table, all the routes, basically, on, on, uh, for that particular autonomous system. And you can see how many there are. So 
A router needs to know paths to many, many autonomous systems. That's kind of a... Might have drops in some areas. Could be outages. Oh. Or it could be just large reconfiguration of the network. Mm. I don't know exactly what the reasons are, but those could be two possible data reasons. Data What's that? Where is this data from? When is this data where, from? Where? 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 Um, I don't uh, recall, but if you, if you go there, uh, you can, uh, th these are the graphs for uh, a few autonomous systems. So why is the graph going up and up and up? The internet is growing, the internet is growing yeah. But more specifically, this could be also due to the fragmentation in address space. You could have a very large internet, and let's say the entire internet is divided into two organizations, and all you need to know is routes to, to the two autonomous systems. Okay. So it uh, provides capability to enforce various policies. Policies themselves are not part of BGP. BGP allows you to exchange connectivity information, and once you have connectivity information, that is when you enforce policies. And how do you enforce policy? Two ways. One, you decide, okay, this is the path I'm going to select. Right? I have these three possible paths uh, that allow me to go from point A to point B, but this is the path I'm going to select. That's one. Another is deciding what to advertise uh, to, to your neighbors. Uh, for example, if you don't want your ISPs to use you as a transit network, what should you do? Let's say you don't want your ISPs to use you as a transit network. You shouldn't advertise the network reachable through the other ISP to the first ISP. Does that make sense? Let's say we have ISPs A and B, and let's say the set of IP addresses that you can reach through A is A, then you never advertise to B that you have a way to get to A. Right? What happens if you advertise to B that you have a way to get to A? They might send stuff to you. They might send stuff to you. And why is that beneficial for, for, for that ISP? Because they might be paying for the relation that they have with A, and you know, the moment that they don't have to use that, it might be beneficial to them. At your expense, of course. All right, so this is something that we talked about already. So here are the different ways in which you might select path. For example, you might uh, want to use more specific prefix. You might want to check to see if the next hop is reachable. Why is that uh, something nice to do? You might find good routes that way, at least the next hop. Prefer, you know, highest weight or highest, so again, local preference is something that is specified to your router. Prefer locally originated routes. Shortest AS path length. Why do you, why might you want to do that? If you're interested in latency, probably a path that goes through fewer autonomous systems is probably going to have Shorter latency, but is that true always? Because remember, we're abstracting an entire autonomous system as a node, right? Let's say we're talking about a transit autonomous system. On this abstract graph, it's just one node, but uh, it might actually take quite some time for that packet to go from one end of the network to another, right? It might go through multiple routers, actually. So we're abstracting the entire network as one node. So even though the autonom autonomous system path length is short, that does not necessarily mean it's a low latency path. Okay. But maybe sometimes we want to prefer that. All right. So there are, there are very various ways uh, in which you might select the paths. So let's, let's try to define the relationships that different autonomous systems might have. The most obvious one is customer provider. Right? One is a customer, another is a provider. Customer usually pays the provider. 
Another set of relations is called peer relationships. So two autonomous systems of similar size, they might decide to connect to each other without having to pay to each other. Right? One place where this really has played out to a great benefit for a lot of people in the world is internet access in developing countries. That we've already talked about the hierarchy of uh, internet service providers, right? So in some of these countries, there are different internet service providers that are customers of uh, larger foreign internet service providers. Now let's say people in the same country, they need to send emails to each other. The only way you could provide this connectivity is for packets from, let's say, ISP1 to go to this foreign internet service provider, pay lots of money in the process for that relation, and uh, this foreign internet service provider will route the packet to the other foreign internet service provider, which will route the packet back to the home country. And finally, you know, you're able to send emails from you know one 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 host to another. This is a this is an inefficiency, right? So, what's the best way to solve that problem? Yeah. So, you have these ISPs peer with each other. Then how does that solve this problem? It's so you need to send some packets from one host to another. You are able to now send it directly. So a uh, lot of uh, educational institutions do that here in the US. What does that make sense? Why would you ever want to peer? Let's say you have university one, university two. Why would you ever want to peer? You always have an internet service provider. You send the packet to internet service provider, and the provider knows how to send the packet to the other university. Why would you ever want to peer in that scenario? It's the same. It's for the same reason that we talked about earlier, right? If you peer directly with, let's say, another university, it's just that relation, and most of the time, it is for research or for other types of. You know, non-profit communication. Uh, maybe the universities are willing to negotiate a cost-free peering for both the parties. Right? But if you're using the internet service provider, the service provider is going to say, well, you're starting to send in a lot more data than uh, you did, so we have to increase the service fees. But if it's just between the two universities, they might be willing to just say, OK, you know, it's a uh, uh, communication between researchers and students, and we're willing to do this for free. So does peering usually make internet routing shorter or longer? Because the alternate, alternative is to go to your ISP who will route to another ISP back down to the party with which you would have peered. How about, uh, so there is this uh, idea of uh, tier one ISPs. These are ISPs with a global footprint, for example, AT&T. These ISPs can, they have their own facility in many, many countries around the world, and they have the capability to deliver packets to pretty much anywhere using their own infrastructure, using the infrastructure that they own. So these are tier one ISPs. Why do they all peer to each other? So what determines if a relationship is the one that we talked about earlier, which is customer and provider relationship and peer-to-peer -peer relationship. What depends. determines that? It depends on who. The customer, you depend on the provider. Yeah. So the provider so if you're both tier one networks, yeah. you don't depend on each other to provide. Well, you mutual depend, you mutual dependence. Yeah. So what happens if you go to at and say, I want to peer with you? <laughs> They're going to laugh at you. <laughs> they might laugh at you. <laughs> yeah. So 
why do tier one ISPs depend on each other in that case? And why are they willing to get on the peering relationship and not customer provider relationship? Let's say my ISP has access to Australia, your ISP has access to Japan. Yeah. You want to more like to Australia. Yeah. So, and if um, those markets are equally important to both the ISPs or approximately equally important to all the ISPs concerned, then they would be willing to peer. Right. Okay. So, you understand why? Sometimes peering relation makes sense. Sometimes customer provider service uh, relation makes sense. Yeah. So uh, I have a question. Yeah. When, when two uh, autonomous systems uh, mm -hmm. peer, that means there's a physical link between them. Yes. Right? So they have to construct this infrastructure. Basically. So they don't have to construct this infrastructure because this, is, this infrastructure is already there. Many big cities have these uh, exchange points. Uh, sometimes. They are run by non-profit organizations. Sometimes they are run by for-profit organizations. And um, this is a big building, usually, where there is uh, all kinds of cables coming in. Some of these uh, wires or cables belong to a certain network. And you decide. Uh, and all the big network uh, service providers will have cables going into these exchange points. And you decide, OK, I want to pair with this other ISP. And uh, you put a switch. And then you connect the two cables. Basically, exchange points. Most of the big cities uh, have that. In developing countries, uh, when they started doing peering to improve the efficiency, most of these exchange points were um, run by nonprofit organizations. Why nonprofit in that case? Well, why did they use the nonprofit model for peering? Because the ISPs were very suspicious that somebody else might uh, make more money than I will, and so on and so forth. If it is nonprofit, most of that concern goes away. So this nonprofit uh, organization that provided this facility that was neutral to all the ISPs, well, it could be a for-profit uh, site as well. OK, so uh, we we're, we're really ran out of time. But uh, let's just talk about uh, this one. One incident, not, not, not from distant past. This is uh, pretty new. So if you want to disconnect uh, internet from the entire world, and if you are, um, if, you are if, if you want to do that, how would you do that? So how does the entire world know about all of the customers that you have? We talked about that in BGP. You advertise what? You, adv you advertise your peers that these are the IP addresses uh, that to, to which I know how to send packets, right? So now let's say I wanted to disconnect all of these clients. What do I do? Still you don't advertise, or if you've already advertised, you withdraw those routes. You tell your peers that these IP addresses are no longer reachable through me. And what happens? Let's say, let's say you're in a country that has just a few ISPs and all these ISPs say, okay, you know, this network is not reachable to me. What happens then? They're not reachable. Yeah, they're not reachable. The routers in the wider internet, they don't know how to send packets to these IP addresses, right? Because the router 